uh, with great pleasure that um, I can introduce Mr. Don Niles uh, as our first speaker for this afternoon. Uh, there are still a few seats up in front if somebody needs to, to come on down, we don't bite. Um, so Dairy Dreams Dairy is owned by two partners, the family of John Tangle and Don Niles. The two longtime friends decided to build a modern new dairy farm in northern Kiwani County. Over the years, the dairy has grown from 1,400, uh, 1400 head to 3,000 cows, <laughs> along with all young stock at the same site. They've always stressed superb cow care as the cornerstone of the farm. Attention to detail, all things cow, is a central core commitment. Along with caring for our animals comes a commitment to the farm, to farm the shallow sh soils of Northern Kiwani with a similar degree of care. So with that, let's welcome Mr. Don Niles. <laughs> Thank you very much, Greg, and um, sincerely thank you to the organization uh, for inviting me to um, come and represent farmers. I'll, I'll also tell you that I've been blessed with some, some wonderful opportunities to discuss things that, that I, I claim to know something about. I've, I've been able to go to England and Hungary and Romania and China and Japan and Brazil and Australia and talk about things like modern maternity cow care, which is something I, I'm very passionate about. It's been a, a great interest. Um, or responsible um, medication use on modern dairies. I, I love those topics. I can do that all day long. Today I've got butterflies over. <laughs> so coming up here as, as the CAFO guy um, to, to talk to this group um, is, a, is, a, is an opportunity. There's a lot of things that we're excited about in agriculture, and um, that's the story I'd like to share with you today and how it fits in with the uh, themes of the other presentations we've had. Um, our farm... Uh, Dairy Dreams is located in Kiwani County, and normally if I go someplace else, I have to show people where Kiwani County is. People in Door County have that pretty well figured out by now. <laughs> it's what, what you have to go through to get to Green Bay. And um, I, I came to Kiwani County. Actually, I'm an invasive species as a farmer because I, I was raised in the suburbs of Milwaukee. My father was a mechanical engineer at Outboard Marine. And um, I had really no interest in, in agriculture growing up. Um, and I always planned to be a physician. And um, that was my plan since I was old enough to know. And we went, my mother had gotten me a copy of All Creatures Great and Small. And I was reading that in high school. It was a good book. It wasn't life changing, but I really enjoyed it. And we had to talk to our guidance counselor in our senior, junior year about what we wanted to do. And I was standing in her waiting room, and she was late. And there was a chart of careers on the wall. It was in alphabetical order, and the last choice was veterinary medicine. I've been reading that book. That sounds like more fun than being a physician, so that's what I wanted to do. Uh, but still, I was going to be working on dogs and cats. But going through veterinary school, I found that I, I enjoyed dairy cows more than working on anything else. Uh, so that's where I, I started my career. I was John Pagel's veterinarian. Uh, we got to be very good friends, and that's where we became partners in um, building dairy dreams and having me become a dairy farmer instead of just dairy veterinarian. I practiced for my first year in New York State, where there were very few cows. And I realized that was a limitation if you're going to be a dairy veterinarian. <laughs> so we, we came back to Wisconsin, and I was interviewing for jobs with several practices. And I came to Casco. Um, Dr. Mike Stoudinger, who became one of my partners, was driving me around and showing me. We got to the top of Spruce Hill Road, and I looked, and it was nothing but farms and silos, every place I could see. I thought, oh, this is the place to be a dairy veterinarian. So I, I came there, and was immediately incorporated into one of the most dynamic, exciting, passionate dairy communities I've ever seen. Uh, the farmers of Kiwani County um, go way back over 100 years uh, when the original immigrants came from Belgium and Germany with their cows, usually two cows per person. Um, and that county has prospered as a dairy county. Uh, and actually, it is the second most concentrated dairy cow county east of the Rocky Mountains. Only Lancaster, Pennsylvania has a few more cows per square mile than, than Kiwani does. And this is a source of huge pride to the dairy people. Uh, we're, we're proud of this indicates that we take good care of our cows. Uh, we provide good habitats for our cows. We provide good feed to the cows. That's why the, we've been able to thrive. So when you talk to dairymen, this is a source of great pride. We're a little bit shocked, however, to realize that that is not universally the way the rest of the world sees the situation. And um, that divide is, is what we want to talk about. Um, in Wisconsin, going back to about 1960, 
Uh, this is not news, even if you're not involved in the dairy industry, this is not news to anybody. The number of dairy herds has dropped dramatically from 1960 to 2010. Um, there's almost a 90% reduction in the number of dairy herds in Wisconsin. The number of cows is, was somewhat reduced in Wisconsin, but to a much lesser degree. Uh, somewhat reduction of cows, great reduction of dairy farms. Kewanee County it was a little different situation. In Kewanee County, going back to 75, uh, the number, uh, or first of all, the production per cow, the efficiency of the cow, how much milk she produces, has gone up two and a half fold from 10,000 pounds per cow per year to um, over 20,000 pounds per cow per year of milk per cow. The cow numbers held steady for a long time. The cow numbers kind of dropped here. Uh, this is actually when I arrived as a veterinarian, but I don't think I'm responsible for that. <laughs> but the, the cow numbers did go down, bottomed out again, and actually Kiwani County, as many of you know, has been rising in cow numbers since that time. Once again, a, a source of great pride for the dairy farms. The reason that, that we have cows there, the reason they do so well, is cows like cool. Cows are ruminants, they digest fiber, uh, that's a fermentation process. If anybody's ever made beer, you know that fermentation produces heat. So cows produce heat. A cow's thermal neutral, neutral zone is about 57 degrees. If it gets up a little higher than that, they're too warm. Uh, so each cow is producing that heat. If you have a barn with uh, 500 cows in, each cow produces about as much heat as a hair dryer on high. So that's a lot of heat to dissipate. We need the cool breezes off the lake, the cool breezes off the bay, uh, the flat terrain that we're in that, that air carries across. It's wonderful for the cows. We've got sand for bedding in this case. Uh, we're able to feed rations of very high quality. You can grow wonderful alfalfa in, in Kiwani and, and Door County. The uh, soil's right for it. The conditions are right for it. So we can put diets together that allow cows to make more milk just by feeding them better and understanding their needs better. We've also uh, been an industry that's been willing to, to change, to evolve, to adopt new procedures. Uh, this is my farm right here. And this is a, um, an example of a farm that we built uh, to a scale that we consider efficient in the modern dairy world. It's what, what's called a CAFO as an abbreviation, uh, but it's a farm that I'm very proud of. I'm very proud of the cow care, the world that we've created for those cows, and um, the, the operation that, that we have for them. So this is our solution to innovation and making a farm model that's successful in our area. There's other ways to do this. You don't need to get big to be new and modern and efficient in the dairy industry. There's some wonderful robots being put in in some of the smaller farms. Um, that's another great way to, um, if, if you don't want to be managing people, you can manage a, a couple of machines and, and milk um, uh, just enough cows for your family. That's been a very popular model in a few places. Um, if you're going on the tours tomorrow, Wasita Farms, Jeff does a great tour there. He shows his approach or his model for um, modernizing their operation into the, the new world and they do a great job there also. There's lots of different ways to do that. Um, size is just one of them. To, to put this into terms that, that make more sense, because the, the um, fact that cows are milking two, two and a half times as much milk on the same number of acres, and with about the same amount of feed and the same amount of water, is a hugely sustainable prospect. With a lot less resources input, we're able to make the pounds of milk that we make uh, if, if our cows were producing what they were 30 years ago, there'd have to be two and a half times as many cows just to make the same amount of milk in the United States that we're making right now. So I, I put this up here. Uh, this car right here was the best-selling automobile of the year uh, that I got my driver's license. In 1974, the U.S. had 14.2 miles per gallon for fuel efficiency. Now, in 2010, recently in 2010, the average was 32 and a half miles per gallon for all cars produced in the United States. Um, so that's an increase of about 128% of efficiency along with countless safety improvements, quality improvements. Everybody would agree that's a modern miracle. Car cars are so much efficient, more efficient than they were, they're so much safer than they were, they're better than they were. We all drive cars, we all get that. In the dairy world, the similar thing has happened. Uh, back in 1940, right at the beginning of World War II, we had almost 30 million cows in the U.S. producing this much milk. Each container represents 100 million pounds of milk. In 2008, we were down from 30 million cows to about 9 million cows, and yet we're producing almost twice as much milk as we were with the larger herd in the past. So the, the efficiency change with the dairy cows with modern management of many different styles has been a truly remarkable story from an environmental impact point of view. 
far fewer resources, about 10% as much water is required now to make a gallon of milk as in the 1940s. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and, and talk about the evolution um, in Kiwanee County and in the, in the dairy um, world largely uh, overall. The, um, as I mentioned, the initial herd development were the immigrant herds uh, from Germany and Belgium coming in and having small herds, maybe 20 herds. They were large families, so 20, 20 herds was very common back then. By the time I got there as a veterinarian, uh, 30 to 40 cows were much more typical uh, for the herd size. And this was the base of the entire Northeast Wisconsin dairy industry. Uh, these were extended families. Um, only so, if, if they had many kids, there was only room on the farm for one, uh, one of the youngsters to take over. So the others would often get jobs outside of dairy, but they'd live right next door. Uh, they were all in the same area. So the farm was its own farm, but it was surrounded by neighbors and, and relations and uh, aunts and uncles um, that are very familiar with farming. The second wave was occurring back in uh, 1983 when I first got to, to Kiwani County, and that was a wave of dairy expansion. This would be about a 220 cow herd. And this wave was because of the new mechanization. Tractors were, were becoming very popular. We had silos, automatic storage systems for feed. Uh, we had uh, fan, better fans to ventilate barns. Uh, so it was, if you were comfortable operating machinery, you could comfortably have about 150 to 200 cows in your herd. These people, the difference between these people and their predecessors were that these people were comfortable with machinery, these people were comfortable with cows. They wanted to have the individual care with their cows, they wanted to have more contact, they were good with their cows, they didn't trust machinery, they weren't comfortable, they're, they're like me, they weren't mechanics. So this was the second wave, and these two waves were about 40 years apart. About 20 years later, this wave came in the dairy industry uh, with, with some newer, larger dairies being developed. And the change between this wave and the previous wave is these aren't necessarily people that are good with machinery. These are people that are good with people. They're comfortable having a staff. When you look back at this size, every farm I ever went on as a veterinarian of that size said they had just as many cows as they could have without hiring any help. That, that was their line. They just didn't want to have to deal with people. Uh, they saw, thought that was something they just didn't want to have to care about. So this wave came when you had people that were comfortable managing people, leading with people, working with people, and that allowed that size uh, to be achievable. One thing I should mention about the, um, the large farms, and this isn't to talk about large farms, let's talk about all farms, but just a, a factoid about large farms in uh, Kiwani and Door County. Every single K4 large farm there belonged to that same family on that same site previously. This was not somebody that moved in from California and, and shoved somebody out of the way. This was that family saying, this is what our, our view of the future is. This is what our, um, our strategy is gonna be to remain in, in, as a dairy, fam, uh, dairy family farm. Well, while all that was going on, I told you the story about the, the, um, uh, the growth in Kiwani County. I talked about the, the changes as farms have changed and modernized. Something else was going on too and that were things like these, these horrible brown water events that occur. Uh, here you can see in this bathtub in a fairly new home, a compliant well, 123 uh, feet deep. Uh, it turned on the tap water and it came out brown and smelly. This is not anything new in, in Kiwani County. I, when I was working on the small farms, it was common enough in these old farmhouses to have a well that did this in the spring and they would simply go to town and get water because it might be grandma and grandpa, but their kids are running the farm and this is just the way it always was. So, so people kind of dealt with that, although it, it's un, 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 unbelievable now that people would deal with that. Uh, but that was not an unusual situation back then. And if I look farther back on the peninsula, the Door County Advocate, you know, always has that, that really neat series about 120 years ago, this was in the paper, and 150 years ago, this was in the paper. Uh, not too long ago, I saw a clipping uh, that talked about Theophile Dewey uh, was living in the town of Lincoln in Kiwani County. My farm is in the town of Lincoln in Kiwani County. Uh, Theophile Dewey died from typhoid fever. He, and the article said it was the worst typhoid outbreak in the history of Kiwani County. Well, typhoid is salmonella. It's, it's not zoonotic. It's not passed from animals to people. It's people to people. 
So at that time, really before the cows were even here, we live in this very fragile area, and even the, the human contamination from human to human was, was causing death back at that time. So the, the area that we live upon is very sensitive. I think we're having a better sense of how sensitive it is now, and we're changing our practices, body thunder our practices, uh, to accommodate that. But that's what I want to talk about today. So the brown water events, um, completely unacceptable, historically fairly common. Not really common that much anymore. Uh, we've had one in the last four years uh, that, that we've seen, but one in four years is way too many. We, we shouldn't tolerate any. Um, at the same time, uh, citizens activists hired attorneys to challenge a, a CAFO permit for a new dairy being built. Um, they petitioned the EPA to come up and in, intervene in, in Kiwani County. Um, things were really coming to a head. You, you couldn't fail to notice that. We started looking, uh, we had experts coming in, um, people talking to the community, and we started understanding more and more about the Solarian Dolomite. Uh, and you can see the map here indicating all of eastern Wisconsin would be this fractured bedrock under shallow soil. Um, and the soil is the only place where anything is filtering when it goes through, whether it be um, a human septic system, whether it be dairy manure that's spread, a uh, golf course fertilizer. If there's three inches of topsoil, you have three inches of filtering, and then it hits the, the cracks in the bedrock, there's no more filtering, it just goes down into the aquifer, into the well water at that point. So it's a very, very fragile area, and I think we've got a, a greater understanding and appreciation for that. Uh, this is not uncommon if you've ever flown over the area. You see these green lines. This is in dry weather over an alfalfa field. Uh, all these lines are the cracks in the bedrock. It's the only place where a, a, a root is able to go deep enough to find water under dry conditions. So just flying over this field, you can see these are all the cracks right under the surface. You wouldn't see that farming the ground. It's, it's still soil, but shortly beneath that soil, uh, these cracks will go right down into the aquifer. We have these... Um, these sinkholes like this, which are direct conduits to ground wa groundwater. If you took a bottle of Pepsi and poured it into the sinkhole, it would go straight down in into the well water. Same thing with a, with a sinkhole here. Um, the farmers in this area have, have recognized these for millennia. Well, not that long, but the, for a long, long time. And they've worked around them as best they can. Uh, but we haven't really known how to protect these uh, sinkholes until recently, uh, when we could take more advanced measures to um, protect uh, the area around that sinkhole. So what happened? How did we go from this thriving, successful, dynamic dairy industry to lawsuits and accusations and um, this, you, you've all seen it in the newspapers not too long ago, the, the, the accusations coming back and forth from the farmers and the non-farmers and, and everybody saying it's your fault, not my fault, and it's, no one knows your fault. And it's just a very, very un, um, dishonorable way of, of conducting ourselves. I think what we should have been doing is looking at the fact that we do have a problem, we're, we're part of the problem, and how are we going to address the role that we play in this problem. So what happened, I think, is this. We got so efficient in modern agriculture that uh, the fact is only 1% of the people in this country farm anymore. If you think back to your grandparents' generation, a lot of them were farmers. And farmers got more efficient, we didn't need as many people farming, uh, therefore people went to college, they went to medical school, they went to law school, they, they took on careers that they were able to take on because there were enough people left to still make enough food for the country. So this efficiency, which we're very proud of, also separated us very much from the rest of you from the non-farming public. So there's 99% of people not farming, 1% of the people farming. Even in Kiwani County, with all the farms we have there, when we have breakfast on the farm on Father's Day every year, um, I, I was president of dairy promotion for a few years, so I would always go to the, the tables where people are eating breakfast and just see if they're enjoying the breakfast and the tour in the farm and, and, and enjoying the experience. And so many times there'd be a family there and they'd say the kids have never been on a farm until today. And they're excited about that. This is farm country. So if, if, you're, if you're in Chicago or you're in New York, what are the chances that you have any connection anymore with the farm? That, that's on us, not on you, to make sure that we keep that connection established. So what do we do? Well, here's sometimes the solution. Let's just go where there's no other people. Let's go to Kansas. <laughs> no neighbor problems here. Um, but that's not a really good solution because then all the cows and all the pigs and all the chickens and everything ends up in Kansas. So uh, 
that we just move the, the problem down the line somewhere. We don't really solve any problem. It's kind of like this. You know, if, if, if the Titanic is, is modern agriculture, and the Titanic is going down, this might be Kiwani County here, this might be Kansas right here, but these guys are be down here pretty soon unless we fix what we're doing, unless we, we address the, the problems differently, unless we take on the challenges differently. So just moving away isn't the solution. We have to find a way to coexist uh, with a healthy environment. So what do we do is we have to earn back the trust and the confidence of the 99% of the people that aren't farming. Thank you. So we got together as a group of, of dairy farmers and a few of our advisors in Kiwani and Southern Door County. Uh, we all got together one day, it wasn't an organization at the time, and we just said, we've got this situation going on. Uh, some of the things we're doing are impacting people badly. Um, we don't have any way of, of connecting with the people that are either being impact, impacted or potentially impacted. We don't even know who they are, for that matter, but we don't have a connection with them. And in order for us to do that, we had to do one thing. And Randy Ebert, one of the, the people in our group, stood up that time and said, unless we're willing to say that as dairy farmers, we're a part of this problem, we've got no business talking to anybody. And you could have heard a pin drop. That was a tough thing back then. It was a very, very electric issue, as, as you recall. And um, a lot of hard feelings, a lot of defensiveness. And when he said that, everybody had to think hard. And then the consensus of the room was automatically, absolutely. We're, we, we, as farmers, uh, we control a lot of land. We impact a lot of land. And if this is a land use issue, we've got to be a big part of the problem, by definition. Once we accepted that and said that we've got, a role to we, we've got a role in making the problem, now we've got to have a role in fixing the problem, that kind of enabled us or liberated us to, to make that next step forward. We got out of the defensive mood and um, uh, started looking at things more proactively as to what we can do. So we decided that um, uh, clearly we're not the, the whole cause of the problem, but we're a significant contributor, so we'll do with our part. If the septics or whatever else or other parts of it, that's for somebody else to deal with. We're not pointing fingers there. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about us and what we're doing and what we can do differently. Let somebody else take care of the rest. It's also our responsibility to creatively and energetically protect our land, animals, and our neighbors. That's our job. We don't, I've, I've never talked to a farmer who didn't care if he contaminated somebody's well. Oftentimes you have no idea. It's not so simple as it used to be that, that you do something today and there's an effect in a well tomorrow and now you're trying to, to deal with it. It's just that we see the statistics each year that there's so many percent of the wells contaminated. It's up or down this year, but it's, it's very indirect measure. So we're just approaching this as an overall situation where we've all got to up our game. And it's okay to not have all the answers, but it's not okay to stop trying. You listen to Dan Egan today, they don't have all the answers on fixing Lake Michigan, or the Great Lakes, but if you're committed to working at it, you can make progress. So we started a group called Peninsula Pride Farms. Uh, and ma made up of dairy farms in of dairy and crop farms in Kiwani and Southern Door County. This is our region. We're a farmer-led, not-for-profit organization in this area, and we're a farmer. We include farmers, businesses, and agencies focused on improving surface and groundwater. So two dual programs. One would be the the surface water. When we read about the algae blooms in the the bay, for example, that's the phosphorus being carried out. Uh, and the surface water, if we talk about well water contamination, that's groundwater. We need to address both. Our organization has 46 dairy and crop farmers. The dairy size is as small as 60 and as large as 6,000. We have about 50% of the area cows and about 50% of the area tillable acres that our group represents. So we're only about half, but it's a, it's a pretty big chunk for starting a new organization and taking on a new challenge. What we ask of our members are two things. One, a focus on continuous improvement. We're not an organization just of elite farmers. We don't claim that we're just cherry picking the best and let everybody else uh, go out their own way. We just want people that are committed to continuous improvement, realizing that nobody's perfect. We can all get better. And as long as you're committed, committed to getting better, even if you've had issues and challenges and, and had some problems before, we'll still bring you on if you're committed to doing, to doing better. We're supported by dues, donations, and um, uh, also support from outside agencies. 
the Nature Conservancy has been a huge supporter of ours. We get a lot of not only funding from them, which helps, but we also get feedback. Uh, for example, saying if, if we're going to be claiming to make changes in the environment, we need to be able to measure the metrics of what we're doing. If the Nature Conservancy spent $20,000 with us in a grant, they want to know how many pounds of phosphorus did not get into the Great Lakes because of what we did, or how many wells did we protect by what we did. So they hold us as a metrics, I think, that make our program uh, much stronger. The goals focus on improvement. We have to define the issues, we have to set the goals, and determine how to measure the progress in protecting both surface and groundwater. Here's, you recognize Jamie Patton from earlier this morning. As good as she was here, that's how she is in the farm. She is amazing. The, the passion that she carries, she's sitting in a, in a hole in the dirt here, happy as a person could possibly be, <laughs> and she's literally massaging the dirt while she's talking, and, and then she'll pull out some worms, and she's excited about how many worms were in there. And um, this farmer, one of our members, uh, actually had several different cover crops planted in this field, and then he was willing to have us go in there with a backhoe for a field day, and they dug a trench into each of these different areas with the different cover crops, so he could show us, and, jo and Jamie could show us, what the root systems look like, what the worms look like, what the, the particle size look like with the different kinds of cover crops and different farming practices. It was very hands-on, uh, very, very um, good experience for all of us. Um, we talk about uh, keeping phosphorus, in particular out of the, the Great Lakes for the algae blooms. Phosphorus carries an electrical charge that makes it sticky to soil. So phosphorus tend to, tends to stay with the soil particles, so really what we're talking about is erosion. Once you have an open field with no cover crop, you get a heavy rainstorm, you see that brown uh, dirt kind of washing off in the ditch, that's carrying the phosphorus with it because the phosphorus is, is adhering to the, um, the soil particles. So really what we're doing with these practices, like um, the cover crops, is to um, uh, keep the soil in place and keep it from eroding and keep it from carrying the phosphorus away. The fact is that the crops need the phosphorus. The phosphorus that we're feeding to the cows they excrete in their manure. That manure we put on the, the field, that manure feeds the crop, the crop feeds the cow. That same atom of phosphorus goes around and around and around. If we let it get away and get into Lake Michigan, we've got to bring some new chemical phosphorus up, usually mined in Florida, and introduce it to the area. That's the last thing we want to do. We want to keep our phosphorus where we need it so we don't have to buy new phosphorus to replace it because we keep leaching it away. The, um, Groundwater program, the, the, the surface program with phosphorus is pretty easy, really. The metrics are there. We know what practices work. We know that if we do a cover crop, we know that, that if we do um, some other protective practices, we can, we can demonstrate a certain savings on, on the pounds of phosphorus. Water quality is a whole different deal. Groundwater quality is a whole different deal. Um, there it's hard to get a count on what's getting down into the groundwater. Um, so we had our first field day on, on groundwater and we just did demonstrations for the farmers as to how to test the depth of the soil over your bedrock. That's the first thing for the farmer to know because your soil maps won't be precise enough to show you exactly how deep the soil is. So we were taking probes and showing people how you can actually probe your soil and find out if you're more than two feet to bedrock, if you're less than two feet to bedrock so you can farm differently. Uh, and now with the new one, NR151 that you heard about, that's, that's crucial for all farmers. But we can go in there and we can find um, the depth of bedrock in a farm field. Pretty simple, but very fundamentally useful. The other things we could do is find practices that we know are going to reduce the potential for nitrates or pathogens to get into the groundwater. Nitrates are just the opposite of phosphorus. Phosphorus adheres to, to soil particles. Nitrogen is slippery. It's got a, the same electrical charge as the soil particles, so it tends to just move past, and that's what makes it easily leach into the groundwater. So if you have a crop growing like this, and you, have, you apply manure, that manure can be taken right up into that, the root system of that crop, and then when you plant your corn crop or something <coughs> through there, the nitrogen is still available for the corn. If it's a bare field, it can just go on down through and, and be beneath the root zone. Another thing we can do is use things like methane digesters to reduce the pathogens in the manure to start with. If we don't want pathogens down in the groundwater, and we put path less pathogens on the ground, we can accomplish that also. So methane digestion, which is not uncommon now, causes about a thousand-fold decrease in the pathogen level, the coliform level in your manure. So in other words, a 3,000 cow dairy would be applying as many pathogens as a 3 cow dairy without digestion. So if you want to go into your uh, shallower areas, 
um, and there's a small farm with no digester and a larger farm that has a digester, they can trade acres and you can take the digested manure into a place where it'll be more protective and the undigested manure can go onto an area that um, is less uh, prone to shallow, shallow ground problems. So part of what our group is doing is collaborating with each other. Not any of us have to have all the solutions, but if I'm trying three or four different things and my neighbor's trying three or four different things and we're putting our data together, we're all learning without all making the same mistakes. The problem with farmers is we're always trying things, but you never talk about them if they didn't work. <laughs> yeah. That's universally true. So now we're putting our data together and we're saying, okay, we tried this five different times, two times it worked great, three other times we didn't get it in early enough, we're practicing early enough, it didn't work very well at all, so we learned a lot from that. The other thing we're trying to do up here is we're different than southern Wisconsin. A lot of these practices that work in southern Wisconsin don't work up here. We call that the subtropical part of Wisconsin, down by Madison. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a longer growing season, so cover crops they get in a little bit earlier in the fall down there. We don't always have that opportunity here. So we're trying to find things that in, in this climate up here, with a little shorter daylight, will make effective cover crops for us. Once again, we're working together, so not any one person has to do all the work and take all the risks. The other thing that, that we offer as an organization is cost sharing. So if we want our members to do something like a cover crop, we can, we can give them cost sharing, which is the funds that we have from dues and from donations, and we can encourage them to put the cover crop in by paying for $1,500 of cost sharing so they can buy the seed that they wouldn't normally have to buy if they didn't have a cover crop, and we can give them some, some cost sharing until they get comfortable with that new practice. Uh, we also offer um, cost sharing for um, testing depth to bedrock, uh, for protecting sinkholes, for putting a grassy buffer strip around a sinkhole, so any manure or any, anything in the surface that's going to get into that sinkhole can be filtered out by the 50-foot buffer strip that you've planted around there. Well, that 50-foot takes, that takes a, an acre of productivity out of a field, so we cost share for our members uh, so that they can help bear that cost of the, the practice. Um, a very exciting thing that's just coming up now is we are starting to see some, some bipart bipartisan support in Madison for what we consider as a bipartisan practice up here, which is farmers working with, with the counties, with regulators, with the DNR on, on these practices. And um, now uh, we have both uh, Representative Kitchens and one of the state senators, I can't remember which one, have put together their nutrient trading bill, which could be huge for us. And that nutrient trading bill is if one point source, in this case we'll say that Green Bay Metropolitan Sewage District, needs to improve their, their waste processing to reduce ph phosphorus a little further than they currently are, it's going to cost them hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. But that's the requirement that's coming their way. They're going to have to revamp their system for an enormous expense. If we as non-point source produce, producers on farms can say, we want to adopt this practice to reduce our phosphorus, it's going to cost a lot less than $100 million, but it's going to cost too much for us to just do it by ourselves, especially in a depressed dairy economy. Uh, they're putting this program together, so now if we can, for example, on my farm, uh, buy a, 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 a nutrient recovery system, and these are just coming online now, they're very, very expensive, $3 million, um, but if we could buy that system, we could now separate out the phosphorus from the rest of our manure, we could concentrate the nitrogen into the other component of the manure, and we could kill all the pathogens, period, because it would have a, a pasteurization effect. If we can do something like that and do the cost sharing with the Green Bay Utility District, that nutrient trading program could be a uh, boon for all of us up here because then we could be adopting practices to be even far more effective than we have been so far. Uh, we just had the, the governor, uh, Joel invited the governor up here uh, last week and he visited with, with one of our member farms and discussed some of the practices. And for me that's particularly exciting because now you're seeing two political parties and farmers and regulators all in the same room, all kicking around solutions and ideas and working together. I think that's where progress is going to come from. So, we will empower farmers with knowledge, training, and shared experiences, and will demonstrate how the agriculture community is committed to doing its fair share in making improvements. I think that um, in the days of the, the bickering back and forth, the people we didn't hear from were the 80% of the people in the middle. 
And those were the people that wanted the farms to still be here, but they didn't want the farms to be wrecking the environment. That's a, that's a pretty reasonable request, I think, and we should be able to live with that. So our group is committed to the idea that no, we don't think you guys want us gone, but we also know that you don't want us wrecking your well, and we have to approach our neighbors. Sometimes that's as simple as, as going to my neighbor. Uh, one thing we know when, when we're applying, going back here in the shallow, we know that if we apply liquid manure on a sunny day, the UV rays of the sun are going to destroy the pathogens in about five minutes. So this is a very, very strong uh, uh, destroyer of the, those gut bacteria. So just a little bit of time in the sun will, will eliminate the bacteria. The problem is that we've gotten in the practice lately of injecting the manure into the soil. So as we're hauling out there, we're not splashing it on the surface anymore. We're injecting it two or three inches or four inches deep into the soil. One reason we do that is it doesn't stink, so our neighbors like that. On the other hand, if I go to my neighbor and I say, you know, we're a little bit concerned. There's some three feet to bedrock here. Your well is over there. We're going to give you all the setbacks and everything that, that we need to give you, but we think it's going to be a little safer if we put the manure on the surface today, it's sunny, and then tomorrow we'll come and we'll work it in. So it'll, it'll stink for one day. You probably want to turn on your air conditioning and close the windows, but we're doing it to save your well water. That's a pretty good conversation to have with your neighbor, and most rational neighbors are going to say, okay, do it. We'll, we'll take the night away or we'll, um, we'll close up the house, and I'm glad that you're protecting our well water. However, we got so far away from our neighbors and our conversations, we were doing things and not having those conversations with them. So now if we just went ahead and did that and it stunk, they'd say, well, there go the farmers again. You know, it's stinking. They're not, they don't care. So we need to have connections with our neighbors, with you, as to why we're doing, what we're doing, and how you feel about it. Because we need the feedback from you um, as to what could make what we're doing better for you. One of the most common things, I take, um, my wife makes 90 dozen Christmas cookies each year. We make 30 plates for the neighbors. And then we'll just take them around and it's a good opportunity to ask, you know, how are things with you? Were the truck traffic a problem with the farm last year? Or anything like that? And they'll say, no, they'll be really polite and you'll ask again and they'll say, well, there was that one time. We had that graduation party and we were out in the yard and there you guys came, haul them in our right next door. Boy, it just wrecked the day. But you have to, people are polite. You have to ask like three or four times before they'll tell you that. Here's my card, here's my cell, my cell phone number, just call me if you're doing anything outside. We'll go someplace else. You know, we're, we're more than, more than um, willing to, to, uh, to support you on that. But if you don't communicate, if you don't know what's going on, you, you cause problems for people that um, you, never caught, you never intended to cause and they didn't know how to, to react or to, to deal with it. So, uh, the concluding remark is that our group is committed to the vision that the Door County Peninsula can have both clean, healthy, safe drinking water and a thriving agriculture community. It's our job to, to prove that to you. We're not going to prove it overnight. We're going to prove it with open conversations. Uh, one thing I, I will suggest is, unlike New York, you live in a farm area here. So if you want to see what's going on in farms, by all means, just call up. I'd love to show you what we're doing. Uh, the farms in Door County, many of them are members of our organization, and even some that aren't, they'd be more than happy to show you what they're doing. Farmers are pretty proud of what they're doing, but they don't want to be going out and, and shouting about it. So just call up and say, you know, we're wondering how cows really live in these big farms, or we're wondering how cows live in the, in the smaller barns. Are they comfortable? Are they cool? Come on in and look in the barn. We'll show you what the cows look like. Make your own assessments. Don't, don't take our word for it. Um, if you want to know what our um, manure practices are, are. Come out when we're hauling manure. I'd be more than happy to, to have you out. We talk to the crew that's doing the manure hauling. If you say, well, I'd like to see your maps to see if you guys really know where the wells are because you're going to be near my house, we'll show you the, the map book that we're using and we'll show you where your well is and the setback that we have built around that. That'll help build up that trust that, yeah, we're not just talking about this, but we're, but we're actually using these measures. So I guess what I'm getting at is, is communication is a two-way street. Uh, we, we welcome your comments and your challenges, and we'd like to get to know you better. So thanks very much.